He was on that, that really clever element where I think if he'd won the first set, especially in these three set sorts of tournaments, if he'd won the first set, there was a very good chance that he was going to go on to win the match. This is the first time that the top two ranking spots have not been filled by either um, Murray, Djokovic, Nadal or Federer since November 2003. You, you don't get the same sort of dominance from the players. It's not like a hard court season where you can predict. It's not like a clay court season where you know Nadal's going to win uh, or maybe Alcaraz has shown up and gone, hi, I'm going to win now. Um, it, <laughs> it's very much open because of the style of tennis. It is. Jacob is uh, he's quite an exceptional player. He's coming up. Um, coming up especially from an area where you don't really see tennis players like the southwest doesn't tend to produce uh, tennis players on the national spectrum very frequently welcome back to the getting a grip tennis podcast here in the uh, kind of sunset settings with a bit of mood lighting how are we doing Merlin? i'm not too bad i'm not too bad i've enjoyed uh, watching some grass court tennis uh, for the first time properly this year so uh, yeah yeah, so clay the season get underway. Clay's done. Grass court season's in full swing now. Um, already got one tournament out of the way. I think we've got we've obviously got Queens coming up, um, hmm. and then I'm not sure if there's another tournament in the week before Wimbledon. Well, Queens isn't coming up. It's literally started today. Yeah, well, so yeah. Um, so yeah, we're going to be talk. Well, we'll talk about a little bit about Murray and you know the the tournaments that have already happened, and then hmm. a little bit about Queens. And then we've also got a little juniors update as well. And then, of course, some tennis trivia at the end, mm. as per usual. Um, but let's start off with, you know, the, the only place we're going to start when we've got Andy Murray's number one fan with us. How, how, how have you uh, viewed what's going on with Murray? Obviously, he's, well, everyone keeps, you keep calling it like a comeback, but it's, it's, it's not like a comeback. Not a comeback anymore. <laughs> he gets like another injury. And it's like, oh, he's going to come back from this injury. Um, but he played. He played really well this week, and unfortunately, again, he's picked up another, um, a different injury this time. Uh, I think it's an abdominal one. Hopefully, it won't keep him out for too long, um, no. because the form he's showing could possibly make quite a deep run at Wimbledon. Um, what, what do you think to how he's been playing? I think, well, again, I think the way he's playing is, you know, it's, oh God, I almost sound like, I'm going to sound like one of the commentators, but it feels like vintage Murray, you know, there's, there's this, there's this clever game plan. He sees these paths to matches and how he's going to win them. I think before he starts playing the match, he understands opponents really, really well. He gets a really good grip on that, that tactical side of things. Um, yeah. And I think he just knows how to make good work of people. And there's, there's quite a lot of this stuff that he, he started to do really well towards the end of his career um, before the hip surgery. Um, obviously not that that was the end of his career at all, but, but before that hip surgery happened, he was on that, that really clever element where I think if he'd won the first set, especially in these three set sorts of tournaments, if he'd won the first set, there was a very good chance that he was going to go on to win the match. There were very few matches where he would win the first set and then not go on to win it, for example, because I think he, he just sort of understood even if it was a battle for that first set, he's then worked out the opponent. And I feel like he'd just ramp it up for that next one. So like I say, those, those battles were won uh, quite confidently. You saw it against Sitsipas, which was a really clever match from him. Um, I felt, I felt Sitsipas never really had a hold on that match at all um, in a way that, you know, well, like I say, we were watching the match for a security camera. Uh, I yeah. think the entire tournament was very badly broadcast, uh, broadcast um, and on someone's back lawn, viewers. basically. Exactly. So we were all a little bit unhappy with you know the quality of the tournament in Stuttgart. I'm not entirely sure why that's the case. Um, again, like not everywhere can be Wimbledon, and not everywhere mm. can be so well upkept. But um, yeah, I, I think that he's just playing very, very well at the moment, and it's very, very clever. And I think we saw that against Berrettini in the final. The fact that Berrettini won is, is a testament more to how well Berrettini is playing on the grass at the moment, like you saw him do so well last year, um, more so than it is a testament to Murray not quite being able to seal the goods. I think I think Murray's playing very well. And as you say, if he gets over that abdominal issue, um, he's going to be a real threat at, uh, at Wimbledon. I saw someone in a comment on YouTube say uh, that he's a second tier um, sort of possible winner. So, you know, you could rank them up. We'll call it a dark a dark horse or a second tier dark horse if you want to merge the concepts of someone you don't think is going to win it, but they they do have that chance. Um, yeah, I I'm, I'm very excited to see it. 
obviously because yeah. i'm a bit of a murray fan but just just a bit yeah um of course like he 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 always had like a pretty good tactical nice anyway even when he was you know fully fit yeah. without any like injury issues but it's even more important now that obviously that he's got you know certain limitations with mm. with his movement and stuff like he, he can still move better than most players but he's just not quite at the level that he was before so that that becomes even yeah. more important but i think we should also commend berrettini literally came back from like oh, right. surgery it's like his first tournament back or whatever yep. and i mean i think he had a, an iffy first match which he just about got through and then sort of slowly built from there and then by the final it was like playing back to sort of where he was maybe in like the first week of wimbledon last year it was yeah amazing like because you don't really know how big a hit that has on confidence when you have a cert, like yeah, a surgery. surgery i think yeah. was it the wrist surgery i can't remember where exactly it was but if it, if it was the wrist and that is obviously like a major a major issue when you're a tennis player so to come back so quickly and win a tournament already is brilliant especially considering it's the first surgery he's had yeah yeah i think um i think it was i think it wasn't his wrist surgery i don't know if it was more hand than anything else um it was a little bit of a weird one for uh, for berrettini i think Mm. um yeah i mean it, from what i remember it was his racket hand so what you know what, what the injury hand, was specifically yeah. um it was obviously the way he was using his racket yeah this is the this is the joy of recording a podcast <laughs> and we have google at our fingertips we sound like we know everything um no the, the point i'm gonna make is I, I think that you know that's probably the key confidence knocker is when you don't feel like you've got full mobility of your wrist at the top and I'll tell you where we saw that recently, and that was team when he came back onto the clay court season. Um, and you just didn't quite see him. This is when Murray actually beat team as well, um, mm. obviously with team coming back. Um, but you just didn't see him hitting through the ball. He's not generating that same pace and that weight of the ball that he's used to doing. Because I think he's just not quite... He wasn't at the time maybe at a confident place where he could snap through and feel like it's not going to obviously cause an injury or some pain or something like that. So, you know, I, I think it's a little bit of that. So it, it's credit to Berrettini that that mental resilience to to not really worry about it, uh, it seems, and still play his best tennis. Yeah. Yeah, he's got, he seems to have a pretty strong mentality. Um, like he's already, I mean, I think earlier in the year, he, was, he did pretty well at the Australian Open. I mean, he beat like Alcaraz in a five set match. Like he's, even in when it's tight, like he really, he really does step up. Um, even though, I mean, he obviously lost to Djokovic like last year in the final, or whatever. But yeah. he still put in like a pretty strong, uh, can't even say my words right, strong showing in that yeah. final. Um, it was just Novak was just yeah, being Novak. As Novak me. being Novak, exactly. <laughs> exactly. So yeah, I mean, he's obviously one to look out for when Wimbledon comes around, assuming that yeah. he's like fully fit. Um, another. I mean, surprise result is that this uh, this Dutch player, who I'm not even going to try and pronounce his name, has come through and won. I think it was his first it's his first ATP, ATP tournament. Yeah, yeah, that is crazy. Beating Medvedev as well, the now number one in in the final. I don't know how much he saw. Taking him, that. taking him in two sets as well, like a pretty <laughs> yeah. a pretty comfortable win by the standards of the world's best players. Uh, yeah, even Medvedev joked about it in in his congratulations speech yeah. as well. He said he said he he crushed the world number two. I wonder what that feeling's like or something like that. Yeah, I have no idea what that's like, but I bet bet it's good. (laughs) Yeah, amazing. Um, I don't know how many times that's actually been done before, but I can't imagine it's very common, especially in this era where there's so. That would be an interesting stat to know, actually. Are you are you hinting at? (laughs) Oh no! No, it's not in the quiz. It's not in the quiz. But it might be next week for you. Let's know. (laughs) Who knows? Mm. Um, Yeah. Obviously, Medvedev. Yeah, is now he's now back at number one as well. Um, We talked about this before, Mm. obviously, with the whole Wimbledon points being stripped and everything. I mean, everyone's talked enough about it, but this Mm. time he will be number one for. A little bit longer, at least, because obviously yeah, Novak yeah. can't defend those points, and obviously Zverev is also number two now. I, I'm mm. only, I, <laughs> I don't know how long that's going to last, obviously, because he's now injured. But I did find an interesting stat, which was this is the first time that the top two ranking spots have not been filled by either um, Murray, Djokovic, Nadal, or Federer since November two thousand and three. Wow! So <laughs> that pretty much like encompasses the whole 
like big four era really doesn't it that's what's that 19 years thanks that again for big. claiming it to be a big four era rather i'm than not gonna i can't i can't era. say big because three. that is a key stat as to why it's always a big four <laughs> that's a key stat i'll just get an earful every time so i just can't be dealing with it that you will that you will exactly <laughs> you can't say it because you know the podcast will just be full of me ranting and raving about the fact it's a big four anyway yes yeah so we i mean we have we did talk about this before a couple of quite a few months ago about like is this kind of the end of any of those big four players just having like a stranglehold on the number one spot at least do we think that that is kind of slowly fading away now I think I don't think Nadal's going to come back in a way that we'll see him dominate as number one Uh, he will still win uh, you know, what he plays in, should he still be playing, you know, depending on this foot injury and, and how, because obviously he doesn't want to do uh, foot injections in order to keep himself going. So he wants to actually let some level of natural healing occur so it's not pain. Um, I, yeah, I don't think anyway. The only person I could see potentially having a run of form that we have seen, just it just happens, Novak being Novak, is is the fact that Djokovic could could take a sort of a serious year where he starts to win most things again. Because I don't think that's out of the cards, given how, again, a champion like Nadal, a fighter like Nadal has come back. There's an argument to say crowds are definitely a helping element to that sort of thing. You know, the fans cheering. Novak doesn't really have that benefit uh, because of the character he portrays on the tour um, and, and how people feel about him. But um yeah i i i think that that's the only way we'll see it yeah well yeah it's that is the only the only one you would see because obviously federer's had his injury issues nadal's got his injury issues murray's obviously got his injury issues and so (laughs) so there's only one left there's only there's only one green bottle left on the wall exactly yeah and i think yeah probably the next over the if the next year is probably when it's going to happen otherwise then i do Mm. see that fully like fading away from that because they'll all mm. be well most of them are already prioritizing the tournaments that they want to play obviously the major tournaments yeah. the major masters events and all that sort of stuff the surfaces so. they like and all that sort of thing yeah yeah exactly because we obviously we don't even know if nadal's gonna play wimbledon yet there's been some murmurs that he will from like uncle tony but i mean no one really knows because i don't <laughs> think this foot injury is this murmurs and mur- murmurs and murmurs like those mm. of us that are football fans as well it's like transfer rumors it's just like why bother oh listening God. to it let's actually wait for the news you know yeah otherwise you just yeah you just wind yourself up exactly exactly uh false promises and the like but no anyway yeah i like i say the grass court season i'm, I'm very happy with how it started uh i hope murray stays fit i hope that he uh, gets over that abdominal issue i'm not entirely sure how bad it is or what what exactly was the issue but um, like exciting things to see from from all of these players who, until now, you may not have considered. Yeah, obviously we've got Queens going on this week, <clears throat> so Indeed. obviously Murray had to re- withdraw from that. Um, mm. I've saw Dimitrov was playing Norrie today. Actually, pretty good match for a first round as well. Um, yeah. He's just blitzing it all over the place, it's like big serves, big forehands. Um, and Norrie's obviously not an easy opponent, especially early on in a tournament. No. And he managed to he managed to dictate pretty well and see him off in three sets. So that was pretty good. Um, I don't know if is there, is there anyone else you see making a run, possibly winning winning queens. Winning queens, yeah, it's a, it's a tough one to really tell. A lot of the a lot of the top ten actually. Um, I think I think it's about half actually, maybe not a lot. Uh, are playing Halley as well instead instead of Queens because uh, mm, yeah, obviously true. that's the case with the grass court season. We always wonder uh, where these players are going to go because there's only really about three weeks um, of actual grass court tennis um, or four weeks if you include all of Wimbledon as well, for example. So, like I said, there's, there's not a huge amount of um, there's not a huge amount of choice. So you, they always end up picking which they want to go to, uh, whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. Who knows? Um, grass mm. is a tricky surface. Uh, there's a reason that a lot of the world's tennis is phased away from it. We'll find that out in question time. Um, <laughs> oh, no. But uh, yeah, I think I think having a short season is probably a good thing uh, for the grass courts, uh, especially for spectator side of the sport. But um, 
yeah, I, I don't I don't have a pick because as we've seen from Stuttgart and the Libema Open, uh, the Boss Open and the Libema Open, for example, um, you you don't get the same sort of dominance from the players. It's not like a hard court season where you can predict. It's not like a clay court season where you know Nadal's going to win uh, or maybe Alcaraz has shown up and gone, hi, I'm going to win now. Um, it, <laughs> it's very much open because of the style of tennis it is. You get the likes of Anderson in years previous where no one thought much of him and then suddenly he's winning. Um, and, you know, you get these, these great finals between players you don't necessarily expect it from and you get the longest match ever on a surface which really should create the shortest matches in the history of tennis. So, mm. like I say, it, the grass court season is it's a bit more wild card and I think that's why, that's why I like it so much. Yeah, it's the combination of the sheer contrast from going from clay to grass and also the fact that, yeah, grass naturally is like a quicker surface or i mean it is slowing down yeah. obviously but that does bring in you know players who basically are in good rhythm on serve for example are absolutely likely to make a deeper run so yeah it's yeah. quite hard to, hard to predict um and yeah they're obviously yeah hal is going on at the same time so we've sort of got like the top players split across the two tournaments so it's hard mm. to really judge who's kind of like in the best form heading into wimbledon but mm. it's just nice to see like it's the it's the fresh the fresh smell of grass the bright green colour, exactly. tennis ba back in the, the capital of England, you know, old traditions, all that stuff. Mm. Um, although it doesn't really feel, still doesn't feel much like summer, but hopefully the weather's going to warm up a little bit. <laughs> we'll, we'll get there. I mean, it is, we'll it is the UK after all, so you can't, can't, really, you can't really hope for too much, no. <laughs> Um, let's get a let's get a, a juniors update then. It's been a, it's been a few weeks. Obviously we've yeah. had we had half term going on, so there's more tournaments going on in the UK. Obviously for younger players, um, and then we've got mm. obviously this young this young player at our local club who's he's in the under fourteen bracket. If I'm if I'm Indeed. not mistaken, fourteen and under. Yeah, of his age. Yeah, how, how's he been getting on in in his tournaments? No, he's doing very well. Um, Jacob is uh, he's quite an exceptional player. He's coming up. Um, it's coming up especially from an area where you don't really see tennis players like the southwest doesn't tend to produce uh, tennis players on the national spectrum very frequently uh, this is largely because it's quite isolated away from west where most of the tournaments are they're, they're more towards a bit more of north or or basically around london you know where the national tennis center is and everything so um yeah he's been doing very well uh, recently got into the main draw of a grade one 14 and under, which is uh, for anyone who doesn't know what a grade one means. Uh, that's basically uh, <laughs> that's basically national level tennis for the age group within which he is uh, placed. So he was playing some of the some of the best players in the country. Uh, those that sit in that top 20, 30, uh, all the way up to pretty much maybe the top 50 bracket. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's put on a he's put on a good show. All of these things are learning experiences. Um, and, and one of the challenges that a lot of this shows is obviously the fact that most of the best tennis players in the country, um, they're mostly private school educated uh, because tennis is very much, a, let's call it a finance dominated game. If you want to get to the top, you can't get there unless you have some capital behind you uh, to actually take you there. Hopefully, uh, players like Jacob are making the case that that shouldn't be the case. Um, and that you know we need to start looking elsewhere when we're looking for players rather than just constantly in private schools um, which funny enough it's not exactly how a lot of Europe does tennis uh, and a lot of the world does tennis like some of the best players aren't always the richest ones in, in other places in Europe for example um, but we need to we need to learn that as a sport um, and make sure that we're getting towards a place where uh, these opportunities are equal um, amongst players um, both male and female as well there are yeah. loads of topics we could cover across this uh, <laughs> spectrum, but yeah. We have we have mentioned it a little bit before with the finances. It's also a similar problem for, it's not just isolated to tennis in, in the UK at least. No. It's like cricket, hockey, rugby to a certain extent as well. It's, it is kind of, it's a problem that has not really been sorted <laughs> since no. basically it began really. Um, because I guess when a lot of these sports began, it was that background or were people of, the, of yeah. the kind of elite level were the only ones that had access to it and it's kind of taking a long time for that to kind of filter yeah. through so that like everyone has access to it but no know, quite right we're still but there. no 
Uh, like I say, I think it's very good uh, the way that Jacob's performing. Um, if anyone's interested as well, um, you know, he, he does have an Instagram page. Uh, his name's Jacob Butler Rose. Um, I can put it on. Yeah, I was going to say, he does have an Instagram page. He does have um, social media. He also has a GoFundMe page. So obviously one of the important things, the fact that it's um, finances, which do determine uh, whether some players make it in the end, um, any amounts definitely help towards the fact that you know, he's playing uh, in tournaments far away from home. He has to travel there, the accommodation, which is sky high at the moment, given the pandemic and all of the uh, associated costs. So, um, yeah, no, like I say, it's it's just something that I will plug because, uh, mm -hmm. you know, it's close to it's close to our hearts in terms of the local club. But it, it for me, it's a good uh, example of where tennis needs to go uh, and where tennis could definitely do with changing. Yeah, and we'll we'll put those links in the in the show notes or in the video description as well. If anyone wants yeah. to help out or whatever, it's much appreciated. And maybe Absolutely. in the future we might include some like footage or whatever of his of him playing in future videos and stuff. Absolutely, yeah. We've got we'll we'll try and get some more stuff out of him, uh, content and quality. Um, and I think it'd be really nice as well if we could get him on uh, to have a chat about tennis. Uh, for someone who's 14 years old, he's very, very knowledgeable at te about tennis. Uh, I mean, you have to be when you get to that sort of level. Um, but yeah, he has some really good insights about the tennis world. Let's get let's get some media training into him early. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. He's going to have to handle it one day. Yeah. <laughs> Us vigorous journalists that we are. <laughs> okay. Tennis trivia is back again. I'm in the hot seat this week. Obviously, Merlin got five out of five again last week. I've yet to reach that score, so let's give it another go this week, see if I have any more luck. Indeed, indeed. And I think I've got a good quiz for you this week. I mean, I'll probably say that every week because I always find, obviously, we love tennis, so all of the questions are interesting to us. Um, but we're taking this onto the setting of grass court tennis. The season that we are currently in, as short as it is, uh, just like the rally length uh, of points, which is actually something very interesting uh, we will come later in the questions. But my first question, question number one, the US Open was actually once grass as well. In fact, once upon a time, all tennis courts on the planet were grass. What year did the US Open switch away from grass courts You've got four options here. Option A is 1965. And then your second option is 1975. Then 1985. And then 1995. Very creative with the, the options there. You're welcome. I... I, felt, I felt like going for decades is certainly uh, something more poignant to, to think about. That's more helpful for me. <laughs> I feel like we've met, we've mentioned this before when we were talking about grips because we were talking about why it used to be you know like Absolutely. more kind of eastern grips and it was also because the court surfaces were well a lot of them were grass they were lower bouncing a bit skiddier oh, right. and I think I, I think it was in the eighties that was the period that we were talking about so I'm torn between seventy five and eighty five it still feels like eighty five is too recent but. I'm going to go with 1985. Go with what you go. You're going with 1985. Is that your final answer? Yeah. Unfortunately, you have to get a grip. The correct answer really is 1975. So you were tossing it up between uh, one of the right answers. Interestingly, I think you got caught between when it became a hard court, which was in the 1980s. Oh. It was actually between 1975, which was the first year this happened, and then the time it became a hard courts, they actually turned it into clay courts for the US Open. So there was a, a brief yeah. switch before they realised, obviously, a hard court would be a good place to go. Um, wow. Well, five so out of five's out of the question. We already know five out of five's <laughs> not happening this week. So we're going to have to look forward to that in a future podcast. We've got at least two weeks to wait before we can see it. Nearly man status is Nearly man is status is there. You've lost the first set, but you could make a comeback. Anyway, question number two. So grass courts obviously are a completely different surface uh, for many players to play on. Players' shoes, therefore, have to be adapted 
And at Wimbledon and some of the other grass court tournaments, they actually insist on it because they want to protect the surface uh, from damage over the course of, say, the two weeks at Wimbledon or a week. We don't want what's happened in Stuttgart, where obviously it basically turns to just dirt. Uh, that baseline is no longer grass at all. It's just complete soil, effectively. So what I want to know is in what way are the shoes regulated within Wimbledon specifically, but also some of the other grass court tournaments? Now, your four options are, is it the width of the shoes that are regulated? Is it the weight of the shoes that must be regulated? Is it the grip on the sole of the shoes that must be regulated? Or are you not allowed shoes? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I had to throw that one in there. Uh, Can't be too serious. Like that. <laughs> Can't be too serious. I swear that was like that Lendl question that other time. Where it's yeah, like, yeah, his oh, hands. His hands. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, uh, that'd actually be good entertainment if they had to just run around in socks, I have to say. I I'm all exactly, for that. Exactly, we all want to see it. <laughs> <laughs> have, you ever tried, have you ever done that thing where you run down a corridor in your socks and you feel like you're like Usain Bolt? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> super fast. Yeah. <laughs> um, oh, it's not going to be width because everyone's got different width of feet, so that would be unfair. It's not going to be socks. <laughs> Weight, I uh, don't, don't really see that. So I'm, I'm just going to go with grip on the sole of the shoe. Well done. That is the correct answer. It is indeed the grip on the soles of the shoes. And do you know, there are no bonus points for this, but do you know exactly what the regulation is for the grip? Do you know any of the detail? Is there like a limit on the length of the like spikes or whatever you call them on the bottom of the shoe i don't i don't really know they're not allowed to be any they have not to, be to be entirely any. flat oh really yeah so it's almost like bowling shoes <laughs> so <laughs> well, that's you good for when, novak <laughs> so you remember uh, the likes of fred perry created a footwear brand uh, have yeah. you seen fred perry shoes uh, are quite flat soled uh, that's exactly the sort of shoe that was designed originally uh, for grass court tennis. That was part of the purpose. Um, so it's a good example of where you see sort of that interjecting into the sort of style uh, generally um, mm. across the, the, you know, the rest of society. But um, the main thing is, ha have you noticed basically when they close that centre court roof uh, at Wimbledon, this is the only place that we really see it in earnest. Uh, when they close the centre court roof, do you notice that the condensation buildup actually leads players to slip quite a lot, especially on yeah. the baseline? Now, that's largely because, yes, the surface has become a bit slippery because of the moisture, but it's also because they don't really have any grip on their shoes. So it's mostly the, uh, mostly the fact that no grip. It's sort of a trade-off between... Um, it's almost like player safety, in a way, and the, yeah. the actual court surface maintenance itself it's kind of like got to preserve the grass trade-off yeah well that's interesting okay mm. one, one out of two one out All of right. two okay so nice easy brief question now obviously the grass court season is shorter that's a hint including grand slams question three is how many atp tournaments are played on grass in a year your options are five, seven, eight, and 12. So you can already wow. see that the Libema and the Boss Open, that's two in one week. Mm -hmm. You know that Queens and Halley are going on at the same time. That's made it four, including <laughs> Grand Slams. And I'll leave you to the rest of it. No, surely not. <laughs> you can't have literally just told me the answer, basically. I haven't. I used to believe that. Or have I? Yeah, but now you're just making it worse because now I'm just going to yeah. second guess myself. <laughs> <laughs> so it's five, seven, nine, or 12. Is that what you said? Five, seven, eight, or 12. Okay, well, it's not 12. And eight still seems a bit high. I'm wondering if there's grass that... I don't really see why you would play grass other than literally... So bear in mind, even weeks. though we have a grass court season... Yeah, I know, they do play other events on grass. There are other which events. Which is a bit silly, but... Points. And don't forget that ATP 250s and 500s aren't the only ones. Oh, God. 
challenges as well. Are we including or not? Okay, well, it's going to be higher, isn't it? <laughs> um, ooh. Okay, I might change my mind then. But I'll, my brain's dead. I'll just go with eight. Final answer? Mm-hmm. Well done. Correct answer. There are eight tournaments on the ATP Tour in a year that are played on grass courts, which goes to show, like, given the amount of tournaments, uh, how few that is, um, especially uh, given that, well, like I said, it's a, it's a complex surface that requires a lot more uh, labour in order to to create a good surface in, in total. But, um, yeah, also the upkeep is, is very important. Uh, yeah, the eight, it's seven without Wimbledon, obviously. Um, so, you know, like I say, you wouldn't have been too far off with seven, but... Yeah, eight is correct. Um, and like I say, there there are four going on in the last two weeks uh, alone. Mm -hmm. And then obviously you've got challenges to consider as well uh, throughout the year because uh, there aren't very many 250s and 500s that are actually played on grass. Very good. Okay. Two out of three. Okay, so question number four. Grass courts often lead to shorter points and there is a turn towards making them last longer to avoid those of us that dominate with our serves, for example. How many shots on the pro tour, both men and women, this is a complete sideways from the introduction to the question. How many shots on the pro tour, both men and women ever recorded was the longest rally? So how many shots was the longest rally, both men and women ever recorded on the pro tour? So your four answers are 78, 212, 501 and 643. <laughs> what on the pro tour in a competitive match in a competitive match what were the first two 78 and 78 212 501 and 643 nah, that's ridiculous i can't be right <laughs> even 212 seems insane like, I can recall, like, normal matches having, like, 40 or 50 as, like, a long rally. So 78 is pretty close to that. So I'm thinking is, mm, maybe that's too short. But it's a big jump to the next one. Ooh, I don't know. Um, I'll go with 212. Numbers higher than that seem almost inhumane so i'll just stick with that unfortunately you must get a grip the correct answer is the highest option 643 this was done at the virginia slim uh open in 1984 on the women's tour uh between vicky nelson and gene hepner the correct answer is the highest option 643 this was done at the virginia slim uh open in 1984 on the women's tour uh between vicky nelson and gene hepner they played an incredible one hour and 47 minute tie break of which one of the points lasted a rally of 643 shots which is the longest it's ever been recorded so quite incredible and the part of the reason i have included that question because it's a cool fact, but also because uh, it's in direct contrast to the way that grass courts tend to play their tennis. So I don't believe this rally was actually played on a grass court itself. Um, but the final question and the fifth question uh, is indeed, what is the average grass court rally length? Uh, as recorded at Wimbledon in 2018. So I'm using this uh, time period stat uh, simply because that's when they recorded it, but it doesn't really change, I must admit. Um, so the answers are one, two, three, and six. What do you reckon? One, two, three, or six. Mm. <laughs> well, obviously it's one. <laughs> Everyone just serves an ace. <laughs> okay it's not one so two again seems a little bit short i mean it's literally a serve and a return so bear in mind the value actually would have been a decimal uh, and it yes yeah, so it's rounded right rounded yeah 
Okay, well, I think between two and three. Uh, oh, that's difficult. Mm. Oh, I'm thinking I'm going to lean towards the the lower end. I'm going to say two. You are correct. Well done. Okay, so we have an incredible three out of five this week. Yes, the average grass court rally length is indeed two. Uh, this is actually uh, less than two and was rounded up because obviously you can't have 0.7 or 0.8 of a rally. I believe the actual number is 1.8. Um, so oh, that's really? the uh, less than two. Jeez. It is indeed less than two. So most of the time, serve does win. Um, and if it doesn't win immediately, uh, then it sets you up for a shot that you can then put away, especially on a grass. What is one of the favourite? Uh, one of what is one of the most coveted tactics on a grass court, especially in singles? Serve and volley. Serve and volley. Hey. That was a nice little pantomime thing there. Um, <laughs> no, exactly. Serve and volley, and and the point of serve and volley is to obviously win it in two of the players' shots or three shots in the rally, for example. So, um, yeah. It's a uh, it's a, far, a much faster surface, uh, and especially when players have to remain a little bit lower based on how the ball skids as well. Mm. And I guess that average will probably go up, or has been trending up a little bit over yeah, recent times. it has been it has been of late, uh, especially as they slow down the grass court uh, surfaces because a lot of spectators obviously want to see some slightly longer matches, um, which is funny considering they're reducing. The uh, well, they're changing the rules to obviously reduce the length that a match could go on for, so they're trying to mm. confine it within a nice little slot of about two hours. <laughs> make it make sense, <laughs> exactly. Anyway, okay, well, yeah, threes, threes are poor showing, but <laughs> it's I'm I'm still keeping my, my nearly man quiz title, so it's fine, so, I'll, I'll embrace that tag. Could yep. maybe I'll never get to five, but you know. I try. I try my best. Well, it maybe not happen. tonight, but <laughs> you gotta you gotta keep that positive attitude going and keep punching away. But I think my brain is just not working properly today. <laughs> anyway, yes. If you have enjoyed this podcast, give it a follow on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts, and on YouTube, give it a like, share it around, subscribe. Um, I would say comment below on comment below on who you think is gonna win Queens. I think and. Mm. Yeah, again, obviously, we'll put the links to uh, Jacob's kind of GoFundMe and all that stuff. If you want to follow along or help him out or anything like that, that'll all be there. Yeah, that'll be lovely. And we will see you in the next one. See you in the next one. Thank you.